My name is John and I'm the campus pastor here at the Center Church. Before we jump into the sermon, I want to remind you that our vision is for every person to be plugged into a community of faith that preaches the Word of God. Our goal is not that this would be a replacement for a community, but rather a supplement to your faith walk. We strongly encourage everyone to enter a physical community where they can be known, use their talents, and work with others to proclaim the gospel. And our goal is that this would give you the opportunity to add to your faith walk. If you'd like more info on where and when we meet, you can find that at centergr.com. Again, thanks for listening, and we hope God speaks powerfully to you in this message. Easter is just a really good time. Now, again, I don't know all of you. I don't know every single one of your upbringings and your childhood story and, your, and maybe your family's legacy or their heritage. But I do know this. If you grew up in Michigan, you are a lot like me. And here's why. When you were in middle school or high school, every night that it looked remotely like you might have a snow day, you were hoping for a snow day, right? We canceled our youth group last weekend because it was so bad outside, which I think is bizarre. And then last year, we canceled church because of a freezing rain ice storm thing. But I remember, I was not good at school. Now, maybe you're all smarter than me, which is probably true, but I was not good at school. So anytime there was like a flurry in the air, I was on my knees in my room. Jesus, please. Please, snow day. That would be amazing. And, and anytime I kind of had a hint of snow day or you started to see the cancellations roll in, I immediately dropped any homework or studying I was doing for that week. I was like, I'm good. I'm not going to need this test. I'm not going to have this assignment due. I'm just not going to do any of it. I, and then I wouldn't have a snow day. And I would get to school the next day and there's just kind of this like really sad depressed aura throughout every hallway of, a, of the high school when there was not a snow day. And I'd walk through and everyone's like, yeah, I thought it was going to be one too. <laughs> like, I thought we were going to get a snow day. And we'd say things like, oh man, I wish there was a snow day. I didn't finish this. Or we had hoped that there was going to be a snow day, but there wasn't. Now for you, again, there's probably things like a snow day maybe you hope for. Maybe you said that phrase, we had hoped that our car would not die, but it did. We had hoped that, that our, my spouse was going to get the promotion, but he didn't or she didn't. Uh, we had hoped that at the end of the school year, our kids would have a little bit better GPA than what they actually ended with. Like We had hoped for all of these different things, but There's something funny about hope. No matter how many times your hopes actually are realized, often they still fail us. Again, whether it's your GPA or uh, the dream car or dream promotion, once you get those things, there actually is kind of an empty feeling after that. They don't really sustain themselves. And I bump into people all the time, much like you probably do, who say, if only I was married to this kind of guy. Or if only I had this kind of girlfriend, or if I had this kind of boss, and then my life would be better. Hope would be restored. Things would be set right. If I got that promotion or the right job, or if I just simply upgraded my truck, or if my kids went to a better school, if my kids were just better behaved in their school. Like, if I had any of those things, life would be more significant and it would be better. But our hopes fail us. And when hope fails you, it it leaves you frustrated. It leaves you concerned and stressed and anxious about the future. It leaves you wondering, does God even care about me? Is hope ever a thing I'll experience? Do I have hope? And I bumped into this feeling just a couple years ago. See, I I started out around six years ago in full-time pastoral ministry doing what I'm doing now. And, And Lindsay and I were really excited to be on staff at a great church over in the Detroit area. But after three years of three different bosses and a lot of church transition, a lot of angst in our church, I I just one day said in my head to God, I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I thought being a pastor or this kind of career track was going to pan out to be. And I realized that so much of my hope in those moments were put in my job and my success and my performance, even as a pastor. And it left me feeling empty. My hope in those things, they ultimately failed me. Well, this Easter, our concern for hope and and our struggling with that very same question is not unfamiliar 
to the Easter story. This resurrection story is full of people who had to wrestle with that question. Do we really have hope? Do I personally have hope? So if you have a Bible or device, I'm going to encourage you to jump to Luke 24. Now the Gospel of Luke is a historical account that a doctor who was following Jesus in the, in the Greco-Roman world decided to capture as much as he could of what Jesus said and what he did. And this is the Gospel of Luke. It's the story that we'll read from this morning. But in Luke 24, here's what we read. We're kind of overlooking the shoulders. We're peering into this story that maybe for some of us we can identify with more than we ever thought. Verse 13, Luke 24. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now remember, in this part of the story, the crucifixion had just taken place, and some disciples had gone to the tomb, but found that there were just empty grave clothes there. And so they're wrestling with what actually went down. They weren't expecting resurrection. Verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Like if you were anywhere near the city of Jerusalem, you know that, that this promised one, this Messiah, the anointed king who's going to redeem Israel, yeah, he died. And that's not what was supposed to to happen. Jesus replies in 19, I love his tongue-in-cheek, uh, holy sarcasm. What things, he asked. Verse 20, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said. But they did not see Jesus. These disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus, don't even recognize that Jesus is right next to them. Because their hopes had been crushed. They literally watch their rabbi, their, their leader, their Lord die on a tree. And that's not what messiahs do. That the fulfilled prophecy was supposed to be that Jesus would live on. His legacy would carry on. His kingdom would have no end. But they're watching that exact same leader, the guy they'd followed for three years, given their whole lives over to, die. Their hopes were crushed. You bet they were asking, do I have hope? Is there any hope left? Has hope run out on me? Because this is a simple truth of life. Hope defines reality. That's true for all of us. That the things that we hope in ultimately define our day to day. Now you can think hope is some abstract thing or it's maybe a spiritual thing or sometimes when you read the right verses or pray the right things you feel kind of a, a feeling of hope or there's some circumstances in your life that give you hope. But hope defines reality. It makes decisions for you. What you place your hope in ultimately will drive your entire life. And for these disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, they thought Jesus was going to overthrow the Romans. The enemies that they had were going to be squashed under his feet. And the, the problem they have is that those enemies are now squashing Jesus. They are literally killing him in the most degrading, humiliating way their hope is lost. This story, this passage of the story, reminds me of Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist who observed uh, people as he was trapped in Nazi prison camps. He watched them, and he was one of these people. And we've all seen the pictures of people in prison camps. It's horrifying. The fact that humans could do that to one another. But he commented on something in one of his journals I think is fascinating. He's looking at these men, his friends, his colleagues that were slowly fading away. And one of the things he observed is that if they took out their last cigarette and they smoked it, he knew that they were going to die within days. Some of them within the same day because they'd given up hope. See, they were going to save that pack of cigarettes when they left the camp, liberated, finally free, everything set right. But he saw person after person 
take out that last cigarette, light it, smoke it, and within 24 or 48 hours, be dead. They lost hope. And he comments in his journal, I think this is so powerful. Without hope, we die. Now for you, that may not mean physically perish or, or your body literally erode or die or something happen. No. But without hope, our dreams die. Without hope, our motivation for living dies. Without hope, you and I, whether it's emotionally or, or spiritually, we perish. We fall away. Our souls cave in on themselves because hope defines reality. And I love what Jesus does towards the end of this chapter. If you skip ahead with me to verse 30, Jesus talks to them and they invite him in, not fully aware of who this guy is, but curious as he's explaining the scriptures and explaining the prophecy. And in verse 20, verse 30 rather, here's what we read. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and began to give it to them. Sound familiar? Communion. This meal representing the cross. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight, which I think is so funny. Like, thanks a lot, Jesus. We're just excited about the resurrection. Boom, now he's gone. It's a peculiar verse. I'll give you that. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We've been for the last seven weeks looking at this story called This Is Us as we journey through different characters and Jesus opening their eyes to some of those characters. Verse 33, They got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven. These are other disciples. And those with them assembled together and saying, It's true! The Lord is risen. And he's even appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I love that that little detail of the story is in there. Here's why. Because this meal, this moment that Jesus steps into, and not just as a guest, but as a host, was a very common meal. It's ordinary. See, Jesus in this instance brings hope in their ordinary context, in their normal lives, and their everyday people just like you and just like me. It's actually very refreshing that Jesus is not come to bring hope in just your worst moments, or hope in your very best seasons, but hope Every single day. Because he knows, without lasting, without true hope, we die. And I love that. I love that this Easter, that God's hope for you and me would be to discover that. And over the last seven weeks, culminating right now and today, we've looked at story after story of people who demonstrated the hope and the grace and the goodness of God. Now whether it's Abraham or Moses We remember David and his story. We remember Job and the suffering. We remember Jonah who who recognized that God loved his enemies more than he did. We look at Ruth and we look at the powerful story of how Esther was used in God's redemptive plan for his people. We look at all of these different stories and all of them point us to something true and something better. I want to watch this quick video and give us a chance to respond to the true and better hope that's found in Jesus. Let's turn our eyes to the screen. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. 
There is a true and better Joseph who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. This is the true and better hope. This is not some old story or historical document or supernatural thing for weirdos who believe in that kind of stuff. No, Jesus is real and his resurrection power is for you. It's for you. It's for you. And today, the only step to receive that true and better hope is just like any good gift. You just have to open it. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to merit more of the gift. It's simply given to you and all you have to do is open it. And that's really why we exist as a church. Our, our mission is to see zero lives unchanged by Jesus Christ. Not because uh, we think that that's some ambitious goal and we should just target it. And it is ambitious. And we are trying our best to make sure that happens in our day and in our age. But that's really the essence of hope. Is that your life would change. That the things that you wrestle with, the addictions in your life, the brokenness you feel, the, the emptiness you feel from the hopes that have failed you. Receive Jesus as a true and better hope. Before I, I pray for us, I want to invite every single person to take this card out. If you got it on your way in, if not, we can get you one. And on the front of it, it said, right under where it says welcome, there's a thing called a next step card. I want every single person, whether you attend center or you're brand new, to take that out and make sure you have a pen handy. On this card, there's some spots to give your information. You could choose to do that or not. We're not going to harass you or do anything weird or sell it to a credit card company or something. But there's six different options on this card. One of those is just acknowledging you're new. One of them is saying, I want to renew my life in Christ. One of them is, today is the first day I want to follow Jesus. Another is, I'm ready to be baptized. Another is, I'm ready to serve. And another would just like to receive the newsletter. I just want to find out more about the center. And all of those are great options. You don't need to feel like one is more important than the other. But here's what I know. Is that all of us, when it comes to hope, can take a next step. And your next step today may very well be to start a relationship with Christ. Or it could be, man, I've walked away from Jesus. My heart doesn't burn for him anymore. I've lost my passion for him. And I want to renew that today. I want to receive that true and better hope. And you can just check off, today I'm renewing my life in Christ. And today, before uh, we do anything else, I want to just create 30 seconds some space for you and God to do business, to really look at what is my next step and to mark that off. And you can just leave that on your seat as you leave. Again, we're not going to harass you. If you want to put your info there, we'd love to follow up with you and just say thanks for being with us. But I want to create some space. So for the next 15, 30 seconds, the band's going to play and you and God can just look through and say, what is my next step? Maybe it's something that's not even on this card and you just need to acknowledge that. But maybe for you, it's starting a relationship with Jesus. Maybe for you, it's renewing that relationship 
in Jesus. So let's take the next 30 seconds, pray and respond using these cards. close your eyes and bow your heads as we focus in on what I feel Jesus is doing in, in our time. I know that for many of us, the desire is not to live a life that's hopeless, but to live a life as the scriptures describe as overflowing in hope, abounding in hope. I know for some of you today was the day you said, yep, I'm, I'm all in. I have questions, I'm not sure. But I, I want to start that relationship with Jesus today. And with no one looking around or trying to embarrass you, I just want to pray specifically for you today. If that was you, you said, yeah, I, I started that today. Today is the day I'm taking that step forward in faith. If you just slip up your hand real quick, I want to pray specifically for you as we move through our morning together. If that's you, say, that's me. I'm starting that relationship with Jesus. Maybe there's a second group of you today who say, you know what, I've, I've walked away and I know today is my day to renew that relationship. Say, Jesus, I'm all yours again. I want to surrender back to you. If that's you, I'd love to pray specific for you. Just slip your hand up real quick. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you overflow in hope. That because of the power and the beauty of the resurrection, we have a second chance. That we can be made free. And God, I'm asking for the person today that maybe is not sure what does it mean to follow Jesus or what does it really mean for me to start that relationship. God, I pray that you would continue working and stirring in their heart. God, I pray for the people who know that today is my day to resurrender that. My entire life, my soul, my everything. I'm going to give that back to Jesus and say, God, do whatever you want to do. Lead me. And I pray for the person today who's just asking questions. Who walks in this morning not having everything figured out and not sure if they even believe in any of this. But who sense that you're maybe doing something and they're curious. I pray that you'd help them to continue to ask good questions. Continue to be environments like this where they can experience the hope that you bring. God, I thank you that the story doesn't end at Friday. But it continues on. And there is resurrection. And there is hope. We pray all of this in your presence and your power. And in your name. Amen.